Pimbal, SMS, please. So welcome everybody to this uh, webinar today. And uh, uh, it is a privilege to have this uh, webinar as a joint venture, which is the Indo-Russia Ophthalmology Summit uh, dedicated to the International Ophthalmology Day in the remembrance of Professor Fedorov. And uh, we are celebrating his 93rd uh, birthday of late Professor Fedorov. Uh, we have uh, uh, with us illustrious speakers, both from Indian subcontinent as well as uh, from uh, Russia. Dr. Boris Maligun, who's the president of Russian Ophthalmological Society, professor of ophthalmology, uh, Fedorov I Microsurgery, Federal State Institution, Moscow. Professor Maipal Sachdev, uh, president of India Ophthalmological Society, chairman and medical director, Center for Sight Group of Eye Hospitals. Professor Natrajan, who's the immediate past president, uh, chairman and managing director, Aditya Jyoti. Uh, I Hospital Mumbai, and who's been instrumental in uh, uh, in uh, organizing this uh, webinar. Dr. Pavel uh, Wolodin, uh, Executive Secretary, Russian Ophthalmological Society, uh, Professor of Russian Laser Academy of Sciences, Chief of Laser Retinal Surgery, Department of uh, Pedro I Microsurgery, Federal State Institution. Dr. Natalia Mechuk, uh, Senior Researcher of Laser Refractive Surgery Department, uh, from Pedrov Eye Microsurgery Federal State Institution, Dr. Anton uh, uh, Kolsnik, uh, again, clinical research scientist of Vitro Retinal Surgery Department uh, from the same institute, uh, Dr. Alexei uh, Pashtev, uh, researcher of the Department of Cornea Transplantation uh, from Pedrov Eye Microsurgery Federal State Institution, as well as uh, Professor Rajesh Sena, who's the honorary treasurer of All India Ophthalmological Society and Professor of Ophthalmology at RP Center in Delhi. So uh, with this uh, uh, galaxy of speakers, I would uh, uh, now uh, request uh, uh, Professor Maipal Sachdev, uh, the host president from All India Ophthalmological Society to say a few words, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Namrata. And uh, indeed a pleasure to welcome uh, uh, our friends and uh, colleagues from uh, Russia led by uh, Professor Boris Malugin, uh, who is the president of the Russian Ophthalmological Society for this joint uh, Indo-Russian symposium. Uh, we have a galaxy of speakers from Russia and um, uh, we have four speakers from India to start with this symposium. And uh, various speakers will be discussing various uh, different topics of which they do super specialization in. So I think thank you very much, uh, Dr. Boris, uh, Dr. Natalia, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anton, Dr. Pavel, uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Peshte for having joined us. Uh, we look forward to an exciting uh, uh, webinar. And uh, just to say that uh, there is so much of regard for Professor Fedorov because uh, even when I was a junior resident in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, there was an Indo-Russian joint collaboration with the Fedorov Eye Institute. And I think he's the person who taught uh, several of our colleagues uh, the art and science of uh, doing uh, radial keratotomy as also IUL surgery. So I think it dates back to uh, several years when this friendship between India and Russia started. Professor Madan Mohan was instrumental in getting uh, uh, Professor Fedorov to RP Center. So I think uh, uh, we owe a lot of uh, things that uh, Professor Fedorov brought into ophthalmology and we all remember him with fondness. Uh, so without much ado, I will uh, uh, look forward to a great uh, webinar and uh, Professor Malugin uh, would uh, be uh, happy to introduce uh, and uh, give us some insights about Professor Fedorov and the excellent work that he has done. Professor Malugin. Uh, first of all, uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, I want to thank uh, All India Ophthalmology Society uh, Mr. President, uh, Dr. Mahipal Sajdev, uh, uh, immediate past president, uh, Dr. Natarajan, 
uh, honorary secretary Namrata Sharma and uh, honorary treasurer Rajesh Singha for uh, organizing this uh, seminar. We really, really appreciate the friendship that we try to keep over these years and uh, to have this legacy uh, of Professor Fyodorov uh, and to keep it uh, uh, as uh, tight as possible. Um, without talking too much, I just want to briefly remind you about uh, Fyodorov. Uh, if you Google his name, uh, you, you will find that he, he is a very prominent uh, Russian ophthalmologist uh, de uh, who developed radial keratotomy. Uh, he actually was born uh, uh, in 1927, uh, actually uh, exactly 93 years ago. He wanted to be a pilot, but because of the accident, he lost his uh, one of his uh, legs, and that's why he went into the medical college, where he worked hard on uh, different uh, bio studying and working on different projects, but. Finally, we were lucky to having him as an ophthalmologist. And uh, you know, uh, one of his inventions, which is a Sputnik lens, uh, the actually iris clip lens uh, that was quite popular at that particular moment. And the first implantation was uh, actually more than 60 uh, years ago. Uh, that's why he became one of the founders of uh, the uh, uh, the intraocular lens community uh, that accepted uh, him as uh, one of the pioneer of that kind of surgery. And of course, radial keratotomy, when the radial cuts are performed from periphery to the center of the cornea. And there was a lot of innovations at that time, first computer programs that, uh, that were calculating the, uh, the results of and the prognosis of the radial keratotomy, diamond knives, a lot of uh, microsurgical instrumentation. So, so it was uh, using ultrasound to measure the cornea thickness and so forth and so forth. So it was kind of, you know, uh, breakthrough and innovation. And we see that the number of radial keratotomies peaked in 1990s uh, with over uh, 1.2 millions. And then uh, for obvious reasons, uh, uh, declined over the years uh, because of, uh, of the uh, laser surgery that arrived. One of his achievements was to build the Eye Microsurgery Institute that was built from the scratch in, in the northern suburb of Moscow. And this is uh, how it looks like, uh, uh, pictured from the drone. This is a, a big uh, institution with some educational facility, outpatient facilities, and uh, manufacturing facilities. And there were uh, there were also other innovations such as buses, uh, microsurgical ships, and even uh, uh, railway um, uh, uh, railway bus that was uh, traveling uh, throughout Russia, and the conveyor belt system that was built uh, uh, both for diagnostics and also for surgery uh, in a linear and a circular fashion that's shown here. However, uh, his uh, one of uh, his major inventions was to building the eye microsurgery complex, which is the main uh, headquarter having in Moscow and uh, ten branches uh, all over. Uh, Russia, as shown here, and each branch is having around uh, uh, it uh, some other uh, smaller uh, smaller clinics. So overall, we now have uh, more than 5,000 employees and doing about 300 surgeries um, a year. So Fedorov was a hunter. He liked horses. He liked people. Uh, he, he liked to interact very much and uh, to meet the new New people. He liked helicopters, and he died actually in the helicopter crash in 2000, uh, in June of 2000. So we, of course, uh, remember him as a great uh, ophthalmologist, and uh, he tried to keep his legacy. And I thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Maliuk. <laughs> it's uh, really uh, great information that you have. Uh, shown to us some wonderful photographs that were really nice to see those uh, old days photographs and uh, and uh, the overview of the Fyodorov Institute as well. Uh, Dr. Natarajan, the immediate past president of AIOS, also has some uh, memories, some fond memories about uh, Dr. Fedorov and the Institute. So we would request him to you know, enlighten us with his, uh, his memories. Dr. Thank please. you. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Namrata, and Dr. Maipal. Thank you, Boris, and a great friend. And I remember the dinner we had in San Francisco only a few months back, but we are missing it again this year. So I'm just sharing a screen.
screen uh, just to show something and uh, we, we are uh, very, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, Dr. Fidrov, I met him in 83 in the uh, All India Conference, sorry, in the in, first Indian intraocular implant conference, which was held in Mumbai, organized by Dr. B.T. Muscati and Dr. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Um, Mujiani, and it was held in Oberai, Oberai. And I was, I was trying to look out, look for the uh, photographs with him, but I'm, I couldn't uh, make it. But I, I think Fugura has visited several times after that uh, to India. And uh, as Admaipal mentioned, that uh, he, he was. And, and I'm happy that uh, from 2008, I think uh, the uh, uh, International Ophthalmology Day is being celebrated uh, on the, uh, behalf of his birthday, which is on August 8th. And so happened the same year my father also was born, 1927. And then and he founded this SM figure you saw. Now I saw this in the, the internet in the uh, institute in uh, Ukraine, which carries in their website. And as you see, you, you can see that. And uh, we have, uh, and, he, and I very well remember his uh, convertible system. And I also introduced that uh, NCARD injection for uh, the retinitis pigmentosa. sir. And he also started a clinic in Hyderabad in uh, India in the, the late 90s. And, I, and then, I, as he said, the gift of RK given to India and you, through the uh, different visit. Okay. Then we can't see your slides. Oh, all right. One Sorry, I'll just quickly go through it. Sorry. Now you can see? Yeah, we can see. Okay, so anyhow, uh, this is the slide I had, and just to say, on the state, which is there in the uh, website in uh, Institute in Ukraine. And then uh, this uh, mentioned, and thanks to President of Russia, uh, uh, Boris and my very good friend for uh, having this. And we wanted to remember uh, uh, the uh, International Ophthalmology Day and Federal's birthday. And of the Peter was a great friend of the Indian. He knew uh, many ophthalmologists at that time, and when he was uh, alive and when he visited. And we are also organizing a public uh, webinar today evening along with the uh, Lions Club. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Natarajan, for that. And uh, now uh, over to the uh, moderators, uh, Dr. Boris, Dr. Pavel, and Dr. Rajesh Sina, who would be taking over the uh, uh, webinar. Before that, Dr. Rajesh Sina is going to talk about the International Ophthalmology Day. And I think we need to emphasize more on this. Uh, this is on the, uh, this is, uh, on the uh, birth, uh, birthday of Professor Fedrov. And this needs to, I think, not only be celebrated amongst India and Russia, but uh, worldwide uh, amongst all the international ophthalmologists. Rajesh, please. Absolutely, Dr. Namrata, thank you very much. And uh, this is a, a very auspicious day, a very a wonderful day when we are celebrating this International Ophthalmology Day, the 8th of August. And I welcome all the attendees uh, from both Russia and India uh, on this day, uh, on this summit. This, uh, this day is celebrated in the honor of this legendary ophthalmologist, Professor Fedorov. And you can see the instruments behind him and how hardworking he was. He was just not an ophthalmologist, not just a microsurgeon. He was a great researcher. And his research in the field of intraocular lenses, his research in the field of radial keratotomy, uh, uh, we all have read in textbooks. Uh, then in 1988, he founded the Fyodorov Eye Microsurgery Complex, which is a state-of-art uh, uh, center for ophthalmology at Russia, and uh, it is a world-renowned center. And in his memory, on his 93rd birthday, that is today, Russia and the whole of the world is celebrating International Ophthalmology Day, and we all are doing it. And I guess uh, what information I could get that 
the ophthalmologist started celebrating this day as professional holiday by uh, in 2004 uh, in his honor and uh, then subsequently it was uh, celebrated as international ophthalmology day and uh, the whole world now knows about it the whole world celebrates it and so does india so does uh, uh, all the countries and this is basically done as a recognition of importance and effectiveness of the hard work of ophthalmologists the industry specialists the improvement of international relations and the exchange in, uh, of experience in this field. And the whole world today in this COVID era is saluting the ophthalmologists who have dedicated their life in improving the eye care of society. And uh, especially in this era when the ophthalmologists are at great risk. And in this era, uh, what a way to celebrate this friendship. And the Indian ophthalmology feels proud to be associated with the Russian ophthalmology we especially thank Dr. Boris Mulyogin, who has been instrumental in having uh, this friendship continued. And uh, it is not only at the level of government or at the citizens, but also at the level of ophthalmologists. And we, the All India Ophthalmological Society and the Russian Society of Ophthalmologists, we have a memorandum of understanding wherein the, which is aimed to exchange, interact, and to provide opportunities to know each other with the concept of mutuality and reciprocation. And we do organize symposium in each other national meetings and you know, uh, uh, facilitate the, the uh, six faculty members from, uh, from uh, the each other countries. So, so uh, just uh, without uh, getting into much into it, I would like to once again invite everyone to celebrate this day with this wonderfully designed Indo-Russian Ophthalmology Summit. Thanks to Dr. Maipal, Dr. Natarajan, and thanks to Dr. Boris for you know being very kind to you know giving uh, to have given their consent for having this wonderful summit, which will be watched by millions. Thank you very much. Over to now Dr. Boris and Dr. Pavel for uh, the the next part of the symposium. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Namrata. So I I wanna. Uh, hand over to uh, the Secretary of uh, Russian Ophthalmology Society, uh, Dr. Pavel Valodin, and would we'll ask him to announce uh, the next uh, presenter. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, oh. we can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank the organizers for um, the invitation to take part in this great uh, Indo-Russian uh, symposium and it's a great honor to be here with you and uh, I'd like uh, to introduce the first speaker. The topic is uh, uh, the topic is current trends in laser refractive surgery and uh, the presenter is Natalia Marchuk from um, Svetoslav Fedorov Eye Microsurgery uh, Federal State Institution. Please Natalia. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, be here and to present here the uh, lecture about the current trends in corneal refractive surgery. Um, I'm very proud to be a part of uh, the Svetoslav Fedorov Eye Microsurgery Federal State Institution, founded by the well-known academician Fedorov, who made so many things in uh, universal ophthalmology. That's why I uh, slightly renamed uh, the um, uh, to my topic, and I would talk and I would uh, focus mostly in um, Russian trends, Russian technologies and corneal refractive surgery. Of course, well known that uh, refractive surgery is very safe and effective procedure due to uh, high and precise refractive results, which can uh, give that uh, for the patients and uh, many patients can each the visual rehabilitation very fast. That's why it's very popular. In uh, 11 clinics of Russian of uh, Svetoslav Fedorov eye marker surgery federal state institution, we perform about 50,000 corneal refractive surgeries per year. And of course, it's not uh, uh, could be realized uh, without the great history about the great background, which was before this. And of course, I um, would t uh, tell a few words about the history of um, refractive surgery and mostly Russian refractive surgery. Of course, uh, we know that uh, um, 
Svetoslav Fyodorov elaborated and suggested so uh, so called Fyodorov card, so radial keratotomy, which um, probably uh, is not ideal uh, uh, for the long term results. And now we can see some complications um, uh, several years after the surgery, but it was the first technology which demonstrated that we can uh, reshape the native cornea uh, for the refractive reasons. And uh, that's why uh, it was the revolutionary technology until uh, now about five and a half uh, million people were operated uh, using this technology. Um, later in the beginning of 18th, uh, the, uh, the epoch of uh, laser refractive surgery started, uh, and uh, it was firstly demonstrated that uh, exam laser can reshape the biological tissue without a terminal effect with a very high uh, and precise result. And it was the beginning of the epoch of exam lasers. Uh, at the same time, in Russia, in collaboration with the Russian Academy uh, of Science, uh, it was uh, the creation of the first uh, exam uh, laser, uh, which was called Profile 100, which used the Gaussian profile of energy distribution and uh, allows to perform the transepithelial Pierke, which still very famous for the uh, correction of the refractive disorders in some uh, cases. Um, in uh, Next uh, years, uh, we have uh, some uh, some uh, third generation of exam lasers, uh, which um, were developed according to the um, according to the improvement of the technologies. And in uh, uh, beginning of the twenty uh, third century, uh, the first um, uh, exam laser with the flying sport uh, microscan was created. Now we have a uh, commercial available, very good machine, which is widely used in Russian and different clinics, not only in Russian, but also in uh, other uh, countries, which have uh, extremely high pulse rate, um, about 100 pulse rate. So we know that only two exam laser machine now has a so uh, uh, high um, frequency of the pulse rates and allowed to create the corneal refractive procedure, not only according to the conventional uh, way, but also using the topo guided, wavefront guided, custom Q uh, ablation and tissue saving, uh, saving ablation. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, it was uh, demonstrated that a femtosecond laser is also available for the um, uh, some refractive surgery needing, uh, needed for the flap creation. And at the same time in Russia, of, of course, we also developed this technology uh, the, uh, which was realized in the creation of the commercially available uh, first femtosecond laser, which we also uh, use for um, the corneal flap creation with a very uh, high and uh, predictable uh, results. So what we have now, we have uh, three main directions for the um, soloing of the corneal uh, needings of our patient. And the first one is aimed for the keeping of the native corneal shape. Uh, because of us, we know that uh, cornea, it's not a sphere. It's uh, the prolate ellipsoid with a negative uh, um, Q value. And uh, according to the conventional ablation, we perform it to the spherical or uh, to the uh, positive uh, uh, way with uh, the induction of the high level of the spherical aberrations. And uh, performing the ablation according to, to the um, Q value guided, uh, aimed for the keeping of the uh, of the uh, um, uh, native form uh, aimed for the increasing of the um, quality of uh, patient needing and in decrease the level of the high order operation. Uh, we, uh, in our uh, Russian machine, we also use uh, this uh, software which allows to uh, examine and to keep uh, the uh, corneal sphericity uh, much closer to the na um, initial way. And here you can see the uh, a profile of the cornea um, ablated according to the conventional uh, ablation with a uh, high um, uh, mid periphery uh, spherical aberration and uh, the uh, cornea which was reshaped according to the uh, custom Q level, um, ablation, which realized in the increasing of the quality of night vision uh, in patients uh, operated by the uh, custom Q ablation. Another group of our patients came here for the correction after 
different um, uh, damaging of the cornea, uh, and all of them have the uh, high uh, um, high corneal irregularity. And of course, uh, the topo guided ablation, which is also available, um, allowed us to uh, restore the corneal shape and to um, return into the uh, initial level, if it's possible. And depending on the level of the irregularity and depending on the um, absence of uh, presence of uh, uh, the corneal opacity, we can do it according to the superficial ablation or sublamellar ablation. And uh, we can perform this surgery after keratitis, trauma surgeries, and dystrophies. Uh, traditionally, uh, laser refractive surgery is performed only in case of very superficial um, uh, corneal um, damaging. But uh, we know that even partial removal of the opacity may be adequate for the patient needing uh, needed uh, because of the uh, removing of the great part of the um, uh, damaged cornea and uh, uh, correcting of the refractive errors and the corneal irregularities. So now we use it uh, for even more deep uh, uh, opacities up to two thirds of corneal thickness. Uh, so we use it uh, according to in the inverted topo guided PRK mode, uh, changing the um, steps of the technology and performing the topo guided step first and then perform the PT, PTK step, which allows to increase the predictability of the refractive results. And here's a very short example of the patient who were uh, operated with these technologies um, after the herpetic keratitis uh, corneal opacity. She has a very high corneal irregularity and a very high um, level of the corneal uh, uh, opacity and after the surgery we can see uh, uh, much more um, uh, uh, much more um, uh, uh, transparent cornea we and much more regular cornea with uh, very high um, uh, visual results uh, uh, the last group of uh, our patients uh, need uh, to uh, re plant reshaping of the nat uh, native cornea uh, form uh, by solving some problem, for example, for the correction of the um, high degrees of myopia or performing the surgery of the very uh, thin corneas. Uh, in this case, we perform so-called uh, trans uh, tissue saving ablations, which allowed us to keep at least 2% of the corneal tissue by correcting of the um, myopia and with combination of the ultra thin uh, corneal flap performing by femtosecond laser, it gives us the possibility to increase the volume of the corrected myopia. And, and long-term results of the correction give, give us a very uh, safe, very uh, predictable and very stable results which were demonstrated by the five years examination of the patients who were operated with this technology. So now we have several options which allows us to um, solve uh, many um, of the patients needed, needed and uh, solve many of the patients of the problems. Uh, so what will be in the future. I exactly know, don't know, maybe something like this uh, way will be um, one of the options which will allow us to correct myopia without any uh, surgery uh, assistance. I don't know, but uh, in any way, I hope that uh, the great future of uh, our ophthalmology in the refractive fields uh, is uh, good, uh, is quite uh, accepted. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for the inviting, inviting me for this meeting. Uh, thank, you so thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Natalia. Uh, so we have another speaker now uh, who will be presenting uh, his experience with laser cataract surgery. So we would like to invite uh, my past as Dave, who is a okay, pioneer here. in the field of laser refractive surgery, and he will yeah. be talking about laser laser cataract surgery. Okay. Uh, can you uh, have these slides? Uh, are they visible? Yeah. Everything. Yeah, yeah, okay. we can see them. 
thank you very much and uh, welcome to this uh, again to this uh, indo russian uh, webinar uh, starting from where my previous speaker left that is the lasers in refractive surgery i'll be now talking about the femto laser assisted cataract surgery as to how the femto laser assisted cataract surgery is revolutionizing cataract surgery uh, i'll be showing you some uh, basics and then i'll be showing you some examples where the femto laser cataract surgery is helping us in pushing the limits uh as regards uh, various difficult pr uh, procedures now femto as things stand today is a tool for the routine as also the challenging more often than not the comparison is made only to the routine cataract surgeries as to how much it improves uh, the normal phaco procedure but i think the examples that one needs to look at is that when you push the limit and you are able to simplify the difficult by using the femto laser technology now if you are looking at uh, the femto laser technology there are certain things which are happening and that is we have to look at the demographics and the demands so when we look at the demographics the younger have uh, younger than the average cataract patients are also demanding a glass free uh, uh, spectacle free spectacle independent uh, kind of a vision and i think the days are not far that we can we will have great intraocular lenses where even press myopia would be treated by doing a clear lens exchange the lifestyle changes that are happening the patients are paying are ready and willing to pay the premium but the important thing is that they are looking at the uh, the holy grail of spectacle independence so therefore what you need to have is the highest rate of post operative satisfaction which is there now when you look at any cataract surgery versus a laser vision correction which was talked about by my earlier speaker uh, the exactness of the outcome is much much better as regards the laser vision correction but the cataract surgery the patients who are reaching emetropia target emetropia are much lower than what you get in laser vision correction so therefore there is a scope for improving the repeatability of a procedure in everybody's hand so you need to have a repeatable procedure in everybody's hand which can be which can be repeated in all types of cataracts which is there so femto cataract is something that is making the cataract surgery into a refractive procedure now when you are looking at a refractive procedure what you want as i told you is predictability and the first thing that a femto laser does is to give you an excellent size shape and position and a more predictable effective lens position by doing an excellent capsular excess the second thing that the femto laser does is that it does the lens fragmentation and therefore it has been shown that if you have harder cataracts the amount of energy that is being used for phaco emulsification is greatly reduced much lower than 50% of what it is apart from that the third thing that it does is to give you the incisions which can be multiplanar incisions and giving you better stability and the fourth thing that is does is that uh, if you are not wanting to do a lens based uh, toric iols and you have a smaller degree of astigmatism that can be corrected by doing the arcuate incisions with the femto now let us just see that apart from the usual uh, uh, situations where we are looking at i am now talking about pushing the limit and looking at various difficult situations so let's look at the posterior polar cataract now all of us know that 30 to 40% of posterior polar cataracts have a pre existing capsular rent and therefore it can cause you a problem as regards uh, the outcome of having a drop of the nucleus or having a vitreous coming out and causing problems in the cataract surgery now when you have a pre existing weakness in the posterior capsule the hydro dissection if you do in a normal phaco emulsification can cause a hydraulic rupture of the posterior capsule now what happens in a femto laser is that you don't actually do a hydro dissection but there is a pre existing pneumo delineation that happens not a dissection but a pneumo delineation that happens once you have passed the laser so therefore this would eliminate the need of doing any hydro dissection or hydro delineation so you really don't have to push in of gush of fluid to actually get the uh, dissection or delineation of the various layers now the femto laser enhances the nuclear disassembly that means that the nucleus has been broken into small pieces you can have concentric rings or segments and this will simplify the nuclear removal that is there our recent publication which is there in the journal of cataract and refractive surgery has shown that the integrated anterior segment oct 
can detect pre-existing posterior capsular rent dehiscence and it will increase the safety of posterior polar cataracts. And ever since we have been using this, uh, the incidence of nuclear drops has gone down very significantly. Now, let us just see that how does this imaging help a person in posterior polar cataract? You can see this is the uh, catalyst system we are docking. Once we have docked, you can see that we will get the OCT image. Now look at this, this is the interior cornea, the posterior cornea, the lens surface, and you can see that there is a defect which is very clearly seen. So there is no posterior capsule here. So we have increased the default setting so that the pneumodissection does not cause any dehiscence of the uh, underlying area. And you can see that it is only at the extreme end. Once we have the disassembly, I ran it at double the speed, don't worry. So you can see that there is a defect that came and a three-piece lens was one was able to insert without much problem. So the femto advantage in posterior polar cataract is that the delineation enhances the safety. So you can have the epinuclear cushion, which will be there. The softening of the nucleus helps tackle the harder grades. And there is a perfect CCC that you have for circle implantation. So this epinuclear cushion will remain right at the end when you are removing the epinucleus. But till such time, you will get an excellent uh, uh, taking away of the entire nucleus without any problem because that has been disassembled earlier by the femto. Now, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Boris, for introducing this malugan ring, which is a fantastic uh, device for the dilatation of the pupil and femtosecond uh, femto laser assisted cataract surgery can be done even in small pupils after the placement of malugan rings. So let us just see that how one can do in this particular case, you can see it's a small uh, uh, pupil which is there as also the patient has iris atrophy which is here. So you can use this malugan ring and once you have this malugan ring in position, you can go back to the femto laser and you can really uh, go ahead and do the uh, the femto assisted procedure so you can see this is the ring that is there uh, you have the iris away and you can do a good uh, capsulotomy that you have and a good nucleus fract fractionation so uh, even small pupils are now not uh, difficult to handle with the femto laser so if you push the uh, limit you can have the malugan ring stay in uh, while you are doing a capsulotomy or nucleotomy and then go back and again uh, complete the phaco emulsification procedure another important thing is that when you are looking at phacomorphic glaucomas or you have a swollen up nucleus the biggest problem that you have is the Argentinian flag sign. Now you can see here a swollen phacomorphic glaucoma. You can see that the iris is very near to the uh, uh, to the back of the cornea. The, uh, he's a doctor who came to us and you can see the swollen clefts. But just watch here that when you did the capsulotomy, there was a huge amount of fluid that came out. But since we are working on a closed chamber, you can see that we will get a complete capsulorexis. So you can see that this is a complete capsulorexis that you get, and then you can go ahead with the uh, uh, procedure and complete uh, the procedure. So the biggest uh, uh, challenge that you have in the uh, hypermature swollen cataracts is that you can have a runoff of the capsulorexis, but when you're working on a closed chamber with femto, you don't have that. Now, let us see that if we push the limit in rock hard cataracts, this has been shown that if the cataract is not white and if there is transparency in the nucleus, then under those circumstances, uh, the femto is able to penetrate the nucleus. And you can see here, this is a capsulotomy and uh, we were debating whether to do an SICS or not, but then I went ahead with the femto and you can see here, can you see the air bubbles that are coming? And you can see that this is a black cataract, which is there, but you can see that the sectioning that has been done by the femto is pretty good and now Dr. Chi has shown that it is actually increasing the energy uh, and you need not do repetitions uh, that you will still get a good cleavage plane. So you can watch here again that we were able to get a good outcome. So all that I'm trying to say is that in brown cataracts and in black cataracts, uh, the femto actually increases the ease of breaking up the uh, nucleus. Now, since uh, we are uh, um, uh, on the celebration of Dr. Fedorov's birthday and RK was something that he gave to the world, uh, it was earlier considered that patients who had uh, RK done earlier and there were the corneal scars which were there, this would be uh, causing a problem as regards the uh, femto procedure. But what we have to just be aware is that it is only if you have thick scars uh, that you could have a problem of less penetration of the energy. So what is important is that uh, you do not do the incisions if you don't have a clear area. 
uh, but the capsule ultimately you just have to increase the energy but what is also important is that you need to use trypan blue so that uh, you are uh, taking care of any tags which may be there the disassembly will happen as you want and that is something uh, which will make the nucleus removal easy so you can see here multiple cuts rk you can see a flat cornea in the center you can see the knee effect and you can see that we are uh, increase the energy we are doing the softening of the nucleus and all that we have to do is that below these incisions you could have a problem and you are to use a uh, trypan blue and once you have used trypan blue you can see that under these circumstances the entire capsule comes out pretty well and uh, the uh, the phaco emulsification of a pre chopped nucleus is almost like an aspiration that you are doing so you can see multiple rk incisions Uh, in this particular patient, and you can easily go ahead and do a femto procedure. So, friends, it is not a contraindication uh, for doing femto procedure. You just have to be a little careful that there may be some areas of skip, uh, which could be there. You can also do femto laser in uh, cases of vitrectomized eye. Uh, and what is important is that the anterior capsular fibrosis, uh, which could be there, can be actually take. tackled very well with the femto laser the only important thing is that if it is there is an emulsification of the oil silicon oil if it comes into the anterior chamber when the patient is lying down that will be an area where the femto will not penetrate so it is better to avoid doing a femto procedure in cases if you have an emulsified oil and that is coming on into the anterior chamber now let us look at a post traumatic subluxation this is a post traumatic subluxation uh, the importance of femto in this is that you can place the capsule ordomy the way you want you can see here this is the iris and this is the subluxation and if you look here there is some amount of vitreous that is coming out so you can see a little bit of blob of vitreous so therefore uh, the femto will give you the advantage despite a subluxation that the that the uh, capsulotomy will come fantastic so you can see there is a capsulotomy that has come very well and we are just removing any vitreous which is there we have gone in posteriorly and uh, injected tricot and i am removing all the amount of vitreous that was causing a decentration of the lens so once you have this uh, we are putting in an endocapsular ring so what i have now is a great capsulotomy i have a pre chopped nucleus and i have been able to uh actually take away the stress from the capsule despite having a subluxation so you can see here in this particular case this is the irrigation aspiration that is being done and we are able to complete the phaco uh, the femto procedure very well so friends in such cases of subluxation you can actually center center you can see that the capsule ordomy is pretty well centered and a three piece lens is being injected uh to actually give more support apart from the endocapsular ring in this particular case so this is what i wanted to show you that femto if you push the limits it is actually a new paradigm in cataract surgery and you get great outcomes in these difficult cases and this is the post op picture of the same patient uh which uh, who was again a medico in this particular case who came to me from the um, state of bihar and the outcomes have been pretty good in this particular case so to sum up i would say as the technology of femto uh, laser assisted cataract surgery evolves it finds widespread use not only in the simple cases but also in complex cases and friends i would say it's the time to take the leap of faith and switch over to the femto uh, to the power of femto to get excellent outcomes for your patients thank you very much for your kind attention thank you uh thank you very much uh, dr mahipal this is a great talk and we really learned a lot from from your experience with the femto second lasers uh, which is a very very hot topic uh, it's my pleasure to announce the next speaker uh, uh, dr namrata sharma uh, she will be talking about another great innovation uh, interoperative oct so oh, thank you it is a pleasure to uh, to be speaking in this indo russian ophthalmology summit on the 93rd birthday of professor fedro uh, and i would be talking to you about ioct guided anterior segment surgeries and i would like to acknowledge at the outset that dr malugan has done a lot of work and has many award winning uh, videos on intraoperative oct in relation to uh, cataract so uh, coming to the cataract surgery first it is a great tool to have in the cataract surgery itself because uh, when you make the incision you know at what level the site ports are being made 
and at what level the uh, main main port is being made whether it is uni planner or whether it is by planner so the architecture the wound architecture gets better then also when you make a capsular excess flap you can actually see the flap uh, being uh, lifted onto the lens and this is of special benefit especially when you have hazy corneas and you can't make out where the edge of the flap is you can actually relocate the flap by moving the eye a little bit uh, onto one or the other side and um, uh, the capsular excess uh, can be very well delineated then again when you do hydro procedures you can actually see the hydro waves inside the uh, uh, nucleus uh, which are generated as uh, uh, the nucleus and the cortical matter is uh, disassembled uh, and as the nucleus is moved again uh, uh, the uh, uh, cleavage of the cortical fibers and the nucleus can be seen then as you make a uh, as you make a uh, crater there you can actually see the depth of the crater and also the underlying plate which is left as you sculpt and as you chop uh, one can again see the chopped areas very well uh, then uh, this is the cortical plate which remains and uh, the cortical plate is snugly fitting the uh, uh, capsular bag which again can be highlighted and when there's a when you remove the entire cortex there'll be a bulge which is present and then you can see that there's a pc which is intact and then you can put the intraocular lens inside uh, iol insertion can be done after uh, uh, putting viscoelastic so that the bulging pc it moves at the back and then just prior to the uh, 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 prior to the aspiration of the viscoelastic one can see that there is a gap which is present between the iol and the uh, pc and as uh, this uh, viscoelastic is aspirated this gap would decrease and depending upon the fit of the bag sometimes this capsule gets crinkly because if the uh, there's a mismatch between the lens size and the uh, capsular bag and sometimes it is taut uh, depending upon the uh, the depending upon the size of the bag as well as the uh, lens both and as you hydrate you can again see that the wound will get closed more on the internal side not on the external side here so you can adequately titrate your hydration as well so that a spindle uh, would form if there's a small desmid membrane detachment which is uh, present at the wound side even that can be highlighted and that can be addressed by putting an air, air bubble there and uh, Uh, subsequently uh, the port side uh, dmd also can be managed likewise now in different situations for instance for instance this is posterior subcapsular cataract so you can see that there's an intact pc uh, which is uh, present here and uh, this would be different if you have a posterior subcapsular cataract and if there's a uh, if there's a gap there you can make out this is a posterior subcapsular cataract although there's not a gap here and in wide cataract you can see that uh, the cortical fibers as well as the fluid clefts and when the fluid clefts are present you know that uh, uh, the there is some these dark areas reflect the fluid uh, areas which are present here and uh, uh, one can then do a capsular excess looking at this and uh, subsequently when it's a complete white cataract so that only the fluid comes out uh, then you will not be able to see anything beneath the uh, fluid that comes out uh, which happens in some of the cases also uh, so in this the capsular excess is being uh, completed and you can actually see the capsular flap there and uh, this is a case in which it's you can't see anything beneath because it's a completely uh, liquefied uh, cortex uh, which is there so as soon as you give a nick you can see nothing but the blob of uh, uh, blob of the uh, fluid which uh, comes out and even in capsular distension syndrome it is helpful notice the gap between the uh, lens and the uh, Uh, capsule and now after you remove that uh, tight rim all around it is just uh, abutting the lens is abutting against the capsule and uh, uh, the myopia of the patient is relieved uh, once you do this uh, because the fluid which is present between the capsule and the uh, uh, the lens has been removed now it is a great tool uh, in cases of uh, uh, desmid membrane detachment for instance in this case Uh, when there's a dmd there you can actually see and you can actually inject the uh, air bubble or sf6 gas now if you didn't have the ioct you would probably think you're done but you're not actually not done because there's still some amount of uh, fluid which is present there and for that you have to actually put this bubble for good 5 to 7 minutes uh, and when you when the needle comes out again you can see that there's a shallow uh, detachment which is there 
so as the needle comes out put some slight amount of pressure there so that uh, the uh, air bubble doesn't egress out and only when it is completely attached the cornea also gets a little bit clearer on the table then you know that your test mix membrane is quite attached now uh, this is just to show that this helps you on the table uh, this was a case referred for corneal transplantation but by just uh, doing a, a, a gas fill uh, we were able to uh, defer corneal transplantation procedure then very useful for big bubble dalks such as in this case so a big bubble is being made using the uh, air Uh, uh after doing trepanation 50 to 60% and once you do that the desmets membrane falls back this is a inverted image this has to be reinverted and after you get give a neck on the overlying stromal layers just look at the way in a live show the desmets membrane is marching towards the overlying stromal layers as this air bubble is coming out so you know that you're still extraocular you've not penetrated the desmets membrane or perforated it and uh, after this this uh, uh, is then reinforced with the help of viscoelastic so like a kangaroo's pouch it moves at the back and then the overlying stromal layers are then removed uh, which are diseased and this is the bare desmets membrane which is actually looking at you which is so beautifully seen on the uh, on the intra ct microscope and then uh, one can then suture the graft in place and this is how i mean uh, visual acuity 69612 after Uh, grafts and the procedure is still extraocular and not intraocular even when there's a there's a, there's a uh, opacity which is present because of healed hair drops then also you can actually see on the intraoperatory microscope and titrate your surgery so this is the trepanation which is being done and uh, layer by layer dissection and just as you come underneath that area over which a uh, little bit of haze is there one can uh, just titrate it looking at the ioct and go a little more superficial in that area so that uh, although you have a little bit of haze but not uh, complete haze especially in the center and uh, this can be very well delineated with the ioct this is in the post op picture and uh, uh, this is uh, 52 microns which is hardly um, any stroma then when you are doing surface procedures like slet again it helps you to delineate the overlying panels with the underneath uh, cornea and when you remove the panels the underneath cornea is quite clear and these are little pieces of uh, limbus which are then placed in a slet procedure uh, so as to cause epithelialization and again you have deferred a corneal transplantation procedure in this and ioct helps because you know where the cornea is and where the panels is so again this is just to show the uh, same procedure after doing a slet uh, no uh, keratoplasty which required and patient was 66 in the post op period then again in cases of desmetoseals for instance such as this large desmetoseal uh, a bit piece of tissue is taken and then this is been glued uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, edges and again you can see on the ioct you can see that there's some gap there so you know that you have to nudge it a little bit more so that it gets stuck to the edges and when it does get stuck to the edges you know that there's no gap there and then you know that you are completely done and you can leave it like this so this is in the post op period then again if you have a desmets membrane detachment in such hazy corneas you really don't know where you are injecting the gas so if you have a intraop oct microscope post dalk desmets membrane you can actually make out and after putting air bubble also uh, you can see that it's not getting stuck so anterior uh, stromal punctures are done and then air bubble is instilled again and then you know it is quite stuck and you know uh, that uh, the desmets membrane is pretty much attached now this i'm sure uh, will be shown in the subsequent presentation but this is a dissect case so when you're doing dissect in hazy corneas you can actually make out where your graft is so once you put the give put the air bubble the graft gets stuck to the back of the cornea and in real time it's like a third eye it actually shows you you know what you're doing without having to imagine it so you know that the graft is quite stuck when you have very thin ultra thin dissect and your graft goes inverted like in this case this is a inverted graft so you don't know what to do about it but if you have a ioct microscope you can make out that now it is in the correct orientation after flipping it and then the air bubble can then be instilled and uh, the graft is stuck pretty much to the back of the cornea and this is uh, just to show how a demec is done so desmets membrane all the disease desmets membrane is removed seeing on the ioct or intraoct this is the desmets membrane scroll which is taken and this is then placed uh, inside the an, uh, anterior chamber and then you have to look at this configuration biceps curl upwards so now this is absolutely inverted so this has to be flipped 
And even if you've not put a S-shaped stamp on it, you can just see that once you get that biceps curl, and then it gets stuck to the back of the, the whole graft is stuck to the back of the cornea. And this is uh, post-operative uh, week one, and this is at month one, you can't even make out that there was ever a graft uh, there. And this is something that we innovated when we uh, uh, had a, a lenticule uh, piece which was stuck in the interface. So we tried to remove it with the help of the um, IOCT because we could delineate on the, on the very same day on the table where it is because we had intraop OCT microscope. So one can delineate the edges of the lenticule which has been, uh, uh, which has been, which is sticking inside the interface. And so that can be, uh, that can be removed. And one can then check the interface to see whether there are any remaining lenticule bits uh, which are present or not. So intraop OCT microscope is a great tool to have. It is like a third eye. It helps you to see things which earlier you had to imagine. And it, it gives you a third dimension into the whole uh, uh, dynamics of your intraoperative surgery. And it is here to stay and I'm sure it will uh, refine uh, further and become better. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Nar uh, Narbrata, uh, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we know that uh, intraoperative OCT is uh, relatively novel uh, and uh, very useful, very useful uh, and um, very useful too, uh, especially in the complicated cases such as optical media opacity, corneal opacity, and uh, thank you uh, very much. So we are uh, moving to the next um, uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the Russian speaker, um, Alexei Pashtaev. And uh, uh, so the, um, the topic is femtosecond laser assisted posterior lamellar keratoplasty. Alexei, you're welcome. Hello, everyone. I hope that everyone hears me. Uh, I would like to, dear moderators, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to share our experience with femtosecond laser assisted posterior lamellar keratoplasty and I would share Russian experience with our femtosecond laser. So, endothelial dystrophy of the cone is a disease associated with dysfunction of its posterior epithelium. Prevalence of endothelial dystrophy is increasing each year due to the increasing number of cataract surgery procedures all over the world. The most common methods of graft preparation for posterior lamellar keratoplasty the technique using mechanical automatic microkeratome. This technology is quite simple and widely spread. 45% uh, of all cornea transplantation procedures in USA are performed by Tsai technique. Usually, transplant is being procured in the eye bank and provided to the clinic. However, disadvantages of using mechanical microkeratome are well known. Transplant thickness is difficult to predict, and it is well known that only transplant thinner than 131 micrometer provides highest visual outcomes. Also, there is quite high possibility of perforation during the second cut. The transplant is often regular. It has thick edges, which uh, provide risk of dislocation and postoperative period, and uh, induce hyperactive shift, about plus 1.5 dioptries. The alternative to mechanical microkeratome is femtosecond laser. The most common way of using femtosecond laser for uh, creating a transplant is applanation of laser interface from the anterior side. Uh, but uh, this way doesn't allow to make a regular transplant because uh, the interface makes the anterior surface of the cornea flat, but it makes the posterior surface irregular. And the lamella laser cut, which is absolutely flat, is been done in the posterior uh, surface of the cornea, which is deformed by the interface. And it provides irregular transplant and not high visual outcomes. The maximum uh, BCVA, which you can achieve uh, with this type of surgery is 0 0.5. The alternative is applanation of laser interface from the posterior side of donor cornea, which allows to make regular transplants. So for this, 
To search, we used a femtosecond laser, which was made in Russia. It's high frequency system uh, with repetition rates higher than one gigahertz. The video represents a procedure of uh, preparation transplant from the posterior side of the cornea. You can see the direct applanation to the endothelium. Um, the procedure is controlled by video camera. Uh, the applanation is really gentle and its diameter about nine millimeters. And this real time video represents that all in all, it takes not more than 20 or maybe 30 seconds for uh, preparation transplant and the procedure is really simple and predictable. So it's done. Uh, <clears throat> transplant, transplant surface evaluation uh, had been performed by atomic force microscopy. The control group was graft created by mechanical microkeratom. Average row of mean mean square was evaluated. The statistical analysis showed that femtosecond laser forms a transplant surface of the same high quality as mechanical microkeratome. Also, endothelial cell loss evaluation in vitro was performed. Um, uh, Femtovisum uh, transplants were the main group and the control group was corner scroll rims of the same donor. We used five phase of ice and live dead cell assays. Calcin AM is a blue one and it represents live and early apoptosis cells. Propidiumidite is a red one and it represents dead and late apoptosis cells. So AC loss uh, associated with uh, femtosecond laser um, transport creation was about 12.5%. Also, we have evaluated the isolated um, application of laser interface for 30 seconds. It, the control was the same into corner scroll rim. So 14% uh, of the thermal a cell loss, or we have gotten this research. And we can conclude that the main reason of ACE and the thermal cell deaths during the transplant preparation is the application of lazy interface. And the lazy engine itself doesn't affect too much. Also, the comparative evaluation of AC loss was also performed, and the control was uh, ultra thin transplants uh, created by microkeratome. Um, AC loss in femtovism group was 13.4% uh, and 10.4% in microkeratom group. And statistical analysis uh, didn't show any significant uh, difference between these two groups. So we could conclude that the AC loss is equal uh, in femta and microkeratom gro group in vitro. So all in all, 32 femtotech procedures uh, were performed. The observation period was three years. The video represents uh, the decimeter access technique, which allows to remove the DM of the recipients. Uh, usually it's quite a predictable technique and almost always it is possible to remove the DM by one piece, by single piece. The transplantation uh, is being performed through uh, coronal incision 4.5 millimeter with boosting glide, and the graft has been unfolded by the irrigation flow and fixed by air. Uh, this technique is also suitable for difficult cases. This is the eye of a patient with implanted artificial iris and acne valve, and you can see the retrocol, the strong retrocolonial membrane, which is really hard to remove. You can also use scissors. Um, the dissection of residual stromal bridges after femta dissection is quite simple and uh, blunt instruments are always used. You don't need any sharp instruments. And the transplantation may be performed through the coronal incision in some special cases. And the transplant also can be unfolded. Of course, uh, ACME 12 is not your best friend during this type of surgery, but if you use two hands and the irrigation flow, you can unfold the transplants. It is possible to fix it. And make concentration. So, 
So, at three months observation period, in 28 cases, transplant engraftment were observed. In four cases, primary grass insufficiency was observed and record of plasty was performed. I would like to point that we didn't require a single rare bubbling. At one year observation period, in all 32 cases, transplant engraftment was observed. Transplant thickness in central zone was about 82 micrometers. And host donor complex thickness in the central zone was 550 micrometers, which correlates with the rates of healthy human cornea. In one year observation period, maximum achieved BCVA was 0 0.8, medium astigmatism was 1.35, and a third of the loss was 31%, and ACD was about 1,500. At two years observation period, uh, maximum achieved BCVA was higher. It was 1.0. Uh, at three years observation period, all corners were still clear. So let me please conclude that uh, 50 second laser allows to uh, create an ultra thin transplant with thin edge uh, with regular surface and without any risk of perforation and Pemtetec uh, surgery technique allows to minimize the risk of dislocation of the transplant in post-operative periods. Uh, AC loss is comparative to TSEC, and it provides quite high visual outcomes. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alexei, uh, for the interesting presentation. It was very impressive. So, uh, Dear colleagues, could we go to the next speaker? So I'd like to introduce Anton Kolesnik and he will be present uh, the topic um, uh, about um, early idiopathic retinal membrane surgery. Please. Just a second, uh, dear colleagues. Um, uh, Uh, first of all, I very appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to participate uh, in uh, such a significant webinar in uh, Svetoslav Fedorov uh, memory. So thank you very much. And uh, my, uh, my presentation will be about uh, features of early idiopathic epiretinal membrane uh, surgery. So with idiopathic epiretinal membranes, um, uh, contractile fibra cellular membranes uh, that occur on the inner surface of the retina causing tangential tracts uh, forces uh, leading to a deformation of the uh, retinal architecture and significant uh, visual impairment. Idiopathic ARM uh, consists of uh, different types uh, of cells, uh, including glial cells, uh, hyalocytes, uh, retinal pigment epithelium cells, uh, fibroblasts and myofibroblasts and the extracellular matrix. Uh, the importance in uh, EORM um, development uh, as, a, as a different study showing is that retinal Muller cells and other cells uh, is uh, in, in the presence of a certain uh, profibrotic cytokines uh, can uh, transdifferentiate uh, in uh, a myofibroblast-like uh, phenotype and start to produce uh, uh, alpha smooth uh, muscle uh, actin uh, and induce, uh, induce tissue contraction uh, that cause uh, metamorphopsia, which is usually the uh, leading and most uh, disturbing uh, symptom of the disease. Um, Surgical, uh, surgical removal um, of ERM and LM is usually performed uh, using a 25-27 gauge uh, vitrectomy systems. Uh, during surgery, both the IRM and the ELM must be removed uh, from the retina completely in order to release the traction uh, on the macula. Uh, surgery for uh, IRM improves or stabilizes visual acuity, uh, decrease metamorphopsia, and restore macular anatomy. Uh, nevertheless, uh, patients with uh, a low preoperative visual acuity do not enjoy a, completely, a complete recovery after membrane removal. Uh, limited uh, restoration of visual acuity in these patients can be due to chronic uh, tractional syndrome, 
uh, vascular leakage and uh, persistent cystoid uh, macular edema. And the purpose is to investigate the functional, uh, structural, and morphological outcomes of uh, RM surgical treatment in different uh, proliferation phases. Uh, so uh, 60, um, uh, 60 eyes uh, of 60 patients who uh, underwent 25 gauge uh, parse plana vitrectomy uh, were evaluated in this study in one, uh, three, six, 12, and 24 months after surgery. Uh, all patients were divided into three groups uh, in relation to visual acuity, and the presence of um, the present study evaluates a, a flat-mounted uh, ERM surgical specimens uh, for evidence of presence of different type cells transdifferentiation or retinal Mueller cells, astrocytes, hyalocytes, ex expressing glial acid fibrillary protein (GFAP). This is a marker of uh, cell activation. Also, women seen uh, CD45 uh, cell expressing alpha SM actin, uh, that is myofibroblast uh, uh, marker, and uh, types of uh, collagens. Uh, we want to demonstrate uh, RM LM removal uh, in different groups. Uh, all the membranes in first group were removed uh, separately from the LM uh, after dual blue staining. Uh, with a uh, helper 24 uh, 5 uh, gauge forceps. Uh, uh, and uh, after a complete uh, RM uh, removal uh, with a single piece, uh, we uh, performed uh, macularexis uh, LM peeling. And uh, yeah, here uh, we present a, a video from the second group. Uh, um, in the second group, all membranes were removed uh, in a single, uh, a single block with uh, LM. And you can see it clearly uh, because of uh, quite uh, strong adhesion to the retina um, and uh, some uh, diapedesis on the uh, retinal surface. In the uh, third group, uh, we revealed um, most uh, strong uh, membrane adhesion uh, to LM, uh, even a crest-like adhesion to the whole retina. Uh, sometimes in the foveae, and uh, they were also removed uh, in unique block, uh, as in uh, group two. Uh, sometimes trying to minimize tractional forces on the macula, and uh, we sometimes performs, we performed uh, vitrectomy around uh, around the remodeling tissues and uh, retinal crest. And um, we perform double staining uh, to make sure uh, to complete ILM uh, removal. Uh, so uh, all surgically removed ILM of first group uh, specimens were found to have positive immunostaining for glial fibrillary exit protein, GFAP, uh, CD45, uh, and women team, uh, indicating the presence of glial cells and hyalocytes. Uh, we observed alpha SM actin also. Uh, uh, positive uh, cells in 12 uh, samples. Uh, they were transdifferentiated uh, retinal Mueller uh, cells and astrocytes into myofibroblast like phenotype. They start to produce a smooth muscle actin uh, and induced tissue contraction. And uh, in this case, symptomatic patients uh, start to complain of uh, decreased visual acuity and metamorphopsia. Uh, as you can, uh, can see, uh, ERM and DLM specimens in this group were removed uh, separately. In the second group, uh, we revealed uh, progressive increasing myofibroblast-like cells uh, that is uh, responsible for the upregulation of type uh, uh, 2 uh, 4, 6 uh, collagen. Uh, also, CD45 positive hyalocytes and reduction of GFAP positive cells. We concluded that the alpha SM acting expressing trans-differentiated um, Mueller cells uh, and other cells, which represents uh, mean fibroblast-like cells and uh, uh, responsible for the membrane contraction. Uh, in the third group membranes, so, uh, uh, representative rough extracellular matrix uh, co component combinations, uh, collagens four and six, uh, little activated helocytes. Uh, and uh, alpha SM uh, actin positive cells. This membrane uh, had strong adhesion to LM and were removed in unique block during vitrectomy, and we didn't absorb any Mueller cell 
or astrocytes in uh, this type of membranes. In the current study, we showed that progression of uh, IRM uh, can be uh, considered as a proliferative uh, uh, fibrotic process with a collagen uh, deposition and uh, further membrane construction. Uh, contraction, uh, increased uh, expression of the transforming growth uh, factors uh, induces the uh, differentiations uh, of uh, different cells into mefibroblast like, uh, granting ERM their con uh, contractile properties. In the ERM represents uh, many types of uh, calligans also. Uh, and uh, improvement of uh, post-operative best correct visual acuity, as well as uh, statistically significant uh, central foveal sickness uh, reduction was observed in all groups, maximum after one year of observation. Uh, post-operative uh, post BCBA was significantly better uh, in patients with uh, good uh, pre-operative visual acuity. In uh, comparison uh, between three groups, uh, it, it was found that there was a significant improvement on uh, uh, BCBA and uh, central foveal sickness in the first group. These patients have uh, uh, very little macular damage, resulting in good recovery of the macular function. Uh, the postoperative ISOS uh, alterations and macular edema was uh, uh, very significantly higher in the second and uh, uh, third groups. Uh, on this basis, it could be concluded uh, that uh, the membrane uh, thickening on construction due to cellular transformation leads to distortion in the external and uh, internal retinal layers. Uh, that's why an early intervention uh, prior to the induction of permanent damage seems more rational uh, for better visual uh, outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anton, uh, so for the excellent presentation. The surgery was brilliant, really. So uh, according to the agenda, uh, we have um, the last presentation, last but not least. The topic is world's largest series on pellet ocular trauma. So we're waiting for the presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And thanks to the National Ophthalmological Society and uh, our All India Ophthalmic Society for celebrating the 93rd birthday remembrance of Dr. Uh, uh, just sharing my screen. Is my screen see? You can't see your screen. No? No. No? No, not yet. Is it seen now? No, no, it is not seen. So at this point in time, I just take the opportunity to, you know, some of the people who've sent messages for Dr. Pedro, Dr. Uh, M.S. Ravindra from Kartik Netrale, uh, Bangalore has said that he was there at RP Center in 1976-77 when Dr. Pedro visited. And it was a pleasure to, uh, to watch him uh, actually operate in the, uh, in the uh, RP Center theater. And, uh, and especially when he worked in the operation theater, and uh, his whole team had come, in fact, who gave blocks, incisions, suturing, etc. I'm sure Dr. Mahipal Sachdev would also uh, remember the same thing. And for surgical preparation, he used malac malachite green, and he also did um, radial keratotomies uh, during that time in RP Center routine. 
and uh, also Dr. G. Mukherjee, who says that he has, who's again a senior ophthalmologist, uh, who says that he has had the opportunity of working with Professor Fedrov at RP Center in 1978. Yes, we can see your screen yes, now. Definitely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Namrata, and thanks for uh, the opportunity. Thanks for the All India Ophthalmic Society. And uh, my talk is on the uh, world's largest series on pelotopular trauma. And uh, the thanks to Dr. Fidra, who was a great friend of India. And I was fortunate even though I was very young. I became his friend in 1983. I want to use the same 93rd Dr. S.M. Fidra's birthday and our hospital and Lions Club of Root Kerala are celebrating International Ophthalmology Day and doing a public uh, webinar on public awareness on eye care. Thanks to my good friend, uh, Boris, for uh, the, the president of the National Ophthalmic Society. So reaching out to the helpless pellet victims in uh, Kashmir. So there was a curfew in uh, Kashmir in uh, July 2016, four years back. The entire streets were uh, uh, like this deserted and suddenly there were mob throwing stones and that's how the pellet of trauma happened. You can see the pellet of trauma, the bodily injuries, which happened uh, more than 10,000 people. And uh, uh, about 1,111 had pellet-opera trauma. And out of this, we have analyzed uh, 777 patients where, with a complete data on age and gender. The mean age was 22 to 22 years. And there was a pre predominance of male gender, 97.7% were males. And the most common age group was between 20 and 29, 397 to 21.5%. 1% uh, followed by age group 10 to 19, about 284 patients with 36.6%. And this is me operating in uh, Kashmir. The, the Sri Maharaj uh, Hari Singh Hospital had a well equipped operation theater, the Zeiss microscope, the wide angle observation system, uh, could be, uh, and also the uh, uh, Alcon constellation. There's no financial interest. They, we, there were like, dedicated assistants uh, who assisted. There were 25 ophthalmologists in the department. Thanks to Dr. Tariq. Uh, Kureshi was the head of the ophthalmology department and, and all the ophthalmology who worked there. We should appreciate them. You can see in this picture, a uh, patient who had undergone a corneal wound repair come, came with a total cataract. And uh, we decided in the International Society of Ophthalmoma, and I also, I'm also the president of uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, Ophthalmic Trauma Society, where we decided after any injury, within six days, we should do the secondary repair, you can see. The corneal wound repair with the total cataract, ultrasound done, and the CT scan showed that the pellet had gone through and through through the cornea, through the lens, which is retina, and back into the uh, orbit. So this is how the, uh, the patient came in a week time, and you can see the corneal suture here. The first, the uh, cataract surgery was done by my colleague, Dr. Kavita Rao, who is the director of cataract and cornea service. And uh, usually I ask the antisecting surgeon to do the cataract uh, uh, and the EFC doing a paper aspiration and then yeah, using the, and then did a intraocular lens implant. And after that, I take over and do the uh, 23 gauge three port vitrectomy. And in this case, we had a, we had, after removing the vitreous hemorrhage, we'll be seeing a, a vitreous hemorrhage and a submacular hemorrhage since it was within a, eight days or uh, within a week after clearing the vitreous hemorrhage. I made a fine retina of me. And then when uh, did a uh, drainage of the submacular hemorrhage at the edge of the arcade so that uh, we did not damage near the macula. And then uh, also used the uh, endolaser around that micro retinotomy and then did uh, uh, endolaser and then they used the uh, silicon oil as a dampener. And uh, completing the anterior post attraction and also the uh, uh, peripheral uh, base extension and then uh, at present, I'm doing the endolaser around the retinotomy. And you see the optic disc and the macular region are clear, no blood. Away from the macular, there were some subretinal hemorrhage. We left it as it is. And at present, we are doing an air silicon oil exchange. And then uh, the under oil also, we done the laser around the retinotomy side. The, the, uh, and then the, you can see the pores are removed. And this is the post operative picture six weeks later. And because of the corneal destruction, the vision is about counting finger one meter. Pressure was all right. And we removed the cornea 
later maybe some refractive surgery could be done for correcting the corneal astigmatism. This is another eye. You can see most of them are young people. We, this is a fake eye. So we have done a critically gauge uh, report approach again. And uh, when the lens was clear, we didn't do any uh, lensectomy. And I, we completed the victor's uh, removal of the victor's hemorrhage, removing the anterior portion fraction. And then I made a panic level incision uh, in the 11 to 1 o'clock. And then a stereotomy also extend 11 to 1 o'clock, about 5 to 6 millimeters. And then we use a forceps with a four pronged uh, uh, forceps designed by myself, my Shanmugam, and uh, Dr. Manish Pape from uh, Nasik, where we grasp the uh, the the pellet, the, the, which is about four into five millimeter of uh, pyramid, uh, like the polygonal shape, with the uh, made of lead, and we, we make sure that the pellet is grasped within the vitreous membrane, and then the vitrectomy is completed. The idea is the pellet uh, should not fall rolling on the retina because while removing again, you can have hydrogenic retinal break. So this is a, a small trick which I designed. You can see the impact site near the posterior pole, and then the pellet has fallen uh, in the interior part of the pitted hemorrhage. So before removing the total hemorrhage, I'm using the, the, the four-pronged forceps, grasping the pellet, which is within the pitted uh, hemorrhage, uh, which is made an uh, incision through the uh, conjunctiva and the sclera, and then uh, removing it, and you can see that uh, the vitreous hemorrhage was teased off, and then the sclerotomy will be closed, and then the conjunctiva is closed, and this is the pellet uh, uh, which is being removed, uh, and then sort of, we see only with within the eye we remove it, and we close the sclera, and then uh, also the conjunctiva, and use the three uh, three ports. Uh, continue and complete the peripheral uh, vitreous basic session and also the, do the laser around the impact site. And then this is another eye where it's a, you can see the fake, uh, in a fake eye where uh, you can see the corneal suture is now. So you can see the corneal suture. We have already a lensectomy done because there was a traumatic cataract which is hemorrhage. So now we are using the code from forceps. And that was designed by myself, Dr. Manish Pape, and my head published as an Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, so, uh, you can remove, see the pellet being removed through the sterotomy. The sterotomy will be closed with a micro suture, and then after completing that, that water type suturing, we complete the tracheotomy, do the vitreous based excision, and identify the uh, site of impact. And uh, we expect there is a fractal tear. So we do an endolipsis around it. Uh, it's treated as a coloboma chloride. And fortunately, this patient had an exit wound and the impact wound close to the optic disc, not exactly at the optic disc. Many patients had injury to the optic nerve and the macula. So the, those patients, in spite of excellent anatomical success, the, uh, uh, vision, the vision did not improve. But if the macula was spared, the central cornea was good. And even if the patient was a fake, we can do a secondary IO later, and then the patient visual rehabilitation can be done. This patient had a good visual recovery because the macula was spared. And uh, recently, in the so the, the, this is another eye where again we are seeing the pellet being removed. And this is the last video where this patient the pellet was. Uh, the initial wound repair was done, and then the patient went back to the village in a few kilometers from uh, Srinagar. And then they, when they came a month later, when I went, so the total there was a supracorneal hemorrhage, there was a vitreous hemorrhage, high femur. And I actually used the AC maintainer to do the uh, infusion of the eye, and then I used the bearing out in the knife to clot, separate the clot from the uh, posterior septal cornea. And I used the, actually the viscoelastic and then placed the trocar uh, posteriorly to drain the supracoroidal hemorrhage, which was, uh, you can see the uh, fluidic uh, coroidal supracoroidal hemorrhage being drain, uh, drained. Again, one more port we are putting posteriorly. The idea is that it is not done through and through so that the part of the port is left within the supracoroidal space 
and by increasing the entropy of friction, the supracortical fluid is drained to the trochlear. And we are squeezing the eye to drain off the uh, supracortical hemorrhage as much as possible. And then uh, we proceed with the three port vitrectomy. And using the AC ventilator as the infusion, and again going through the uh, limbus, uh, clearing the vitreous hemorrhage from the paspena region so that when we make the uh, trochlear cannula through the paspena, we make sure that the uh, which is uh, the port is uh, exact, the instrument is exactly in the vitreous cavity so that you can see a lot of vitreous clot, a blood clot over the base. And then uh, we have to make sure that the uh, uh, entire thing is penetrated well so that you don't produce a supracoronal detachment while doing the vitrectomy. And you make sure that the port is uh, very well uh, toileted by doing a vitrectomy. And then you can see subractal hemorrhage, supracoronal hemorrhage. And uh, this looks like a totally gone case, but I don't give up. And uh, I actually complete the vitrectomy and then open up the funnel and then use carbon liquid to squeeze out the subretinal hemorrhage. And I actually use the, either the existing break or make a peripheral retinal uh, retinotomy and use the uh, carbon liquid to squeeze out the subretinal hemorrhage. And you already saw the ports are kept open uh, in the supracortical space so that if there is a residual supracortical hemorrhage that is being drained out when you are increasing the intraocular pressure. It need a patience, you need persistence, you need a perfection in the, doing the surgery. And the, the, this is what the New York Times article covered in 2016 and which was quoted by the President of the American Academy during the recent uh, uh, rubber bullet injuries which has happened in uh, America following the George Floyd uh, uh, killing. And you can see the peripheral subretinal uh, uh, hemorrhage drainage and you can see the retina getting attached uh, when you're using the peripheral carbon liquid and you have to do a thorough which is basic session and, uh, and remove off all the, and flatten the retina. And then uh, also after clearing the subretinal hemorrhage, you can see still some subretinal hemorrhage is coming through the uh, peripheral retinotomy and then uh, it's just coming over the uh, peripheral carbon liquid anteriorly. You, you also drain it and uh, uh, and then we finally do a PFCL oil exchange. And uh, so you, you can see at the uh, uh, almost uh, at the nearing the end of surgery, where after clearing the uh, all the retinal folds uh, under the peripheral carbon liquid, endolizer is being done. And as uh, I looked so terribly, so at least we had an attached retina at the conclusion of three hour surgery. And uh, now we are re re doing the PFCL. Silicon oil exchange. And I think it's a back breaking surgery. That's the reason which the surgeon has to be not only courageous, you have to have a strong back so that you operate. And here, when I was doing, you can see the optic disc and the uh, macula attached. And then uh, I was operating from morning 7 to 9 11 in uh, Srinagar. Thanks to the entire team in uh, uh, Srinagar who are very cooperative. And at, uh, at the conclusion, I keep the air in the anti chamber. And then uh, this is the team, and I've taken two of my ex-fellows, who is now one in Africa and one in Delhi, Dr. Kensho, and uh, that's the team in Kashmir. You can see Dr. Uh, uh, Tariq Kureshi, who is the, the head of the department, and their social workers, and the Borderless World Foundation who have donated the, uh, the ambulance called the Kashmir Lifeline, as well as they took me from Mumbai to uh, Srinagar for doing the surgeries for five months. I went five months and thanks to the government of Kashmir who gave me an outstanding citizen award. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadarajan. It's, uh, it was very uh, impressive, really, uh, severe trauma, military trauma, and uh, really, uh, really extreme vitreoretinal surgery. Thank you so much. It's a great Thank experience. you. I hope uh, we we'll all have a physical meeting and have the faculty from Russia coming to our All India conference. And I don't, know, I don't know whether we'll have a virtual or a hybrid conference in the 2021. Dr. Namrata and all of us, and Dr. Maipal, we are all eager to have a physical conference, including our scientific chairman. And the same thing, we are also happy to come to Russia whenever the flights open and when it is safe. And it's uh, great to have 
and I listen to the lectures and I think uh, is Boris there or already he's gone? Is there Boris? Oh. Uh, my father is there, my father. We have got to go. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, 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 can I say something? <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, all organizers, uh, uh, moderators of the uh, joint summit, and all the speakers, uh, as well as uh, an all Indian and Russian ophthalmologists who found the opportunity to join us. Um, and take part in the Indian-Russian Symposium on such memorial day, the 93rd anniversary of uh, 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 world-famous scientist ophthalmologist, academician Svetoslav Fedorov. And uh, also, I wish everyone professional success and prosperity. Uh, we're looking forward and hope that soon we will be able to meet not only in the format of virtual conferences, but, but also conferences with in-person participation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pavel. And uh, if there are any questions or comments uh, from the panel on the webinar, on the scientific content of the webinar, uh, if there are any questions or uh, any comments from anybody? I think we had a great session and uh, all the I top have uh, one. Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Namrata, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was just seeing when you were showing the femtosecond uh, laser surgeries, uh, the intra OCT microscope from the catalyst machine was also working. And do you think, I mean, that helps a lot in uh, the online uh, OCT that keeps uh, moving or just prior to planning of surgeries, it helps a lot. And, and I, do, I really don't know how, uh, how much would you need an intra-op OCT microscope if you already have that pre-op planning part taken care of in your own, uh, in your own uh, a catalyst machine or for that matter lens x or whatever femtosecond platform is so i think both of them are complementary to each other it is not that uh, uh, so that is a dynamic in vivo uh, intra opacity that we are seeing this is at that particular time so what exactly has happened after the uh, femto delineation has happened the pneumo dissection has happened and the capsulotomy etc so you can get a real time image of what is happening and you can uh, get so uh, get uh, more information so i think it is something uh, that is going to be helpful to you uh, to have both of them available because the initial image is going to help you plan the surgery and uh, the second image that you have which is the, the in vivo in, uh, uh, in vivo uh, intra city that is going to help you plan your further steps and to modify them accordingly so I think they are complementary to each other. Uh, I also have one query, like you showed that small pupil using Milugan ring. So yes. did you put a suture or you, you used a high viscosity viscoelastic? And if you use so if high you viscosity... Use a, yeah, if you use a high viscosity... High viscosity yeah, energy, you can, yeah. energy, energy has to be increased. Otherwise, yeah. if you wash it off and then you need to put a suture. So the advantage, uh, 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 the advantage uh, that is there is that you can actually change uh, both of these uh, uh, parameters, uh, the energy settings, or you. Uh, 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 the advantage, sorry, in the catalyst system is that the docking is reasonably soft. So this is uh, uh, more advantageous where you can have the catalyst and the uh, the uh, microscope in the same OR. So you can prep the patient, move it from one side to the other side and then do that. So yes, if you have viscoelastic, uh, that was the other day pointed out by Dr. Kumar that he uses a high viscosity viscoelastic only at the wound edge uh, rather than having it uh, through the entire chamber. Uh, I also have used it and used Milugan ring to enlarge the pupil and then I've done. So I had to increase the energy level because I used uh, viscoelastic and did not put the suture. So high viscosity viscoelastic was used and then the energy level had to be increased. 
yeah because it dampens the passage of the energy because uh, it is not as efficient as you would if you have an aqueous or pss in the chamber so that's absolutely right that increase the energy levels dr natalia i have a question for you you mentioned that you did use uh, laser uh, lasers in cases of scars which were subsequent to herpes keratitis so what would be the time gap when you would try to Uh, remove these scars with the help of laser because uh, thank you every chance every chance that reactivation of you know the herpes may occur in these cases yes of course it's a very good question uh we uh, so we know, we uh, think that one year after the last uh, episode of the herpes uh, keratitis without any treatment and we use of course the pcr uh, and blood uh, and tear lacrimal fluid analysis before a uh, decision uh, about the surgery and if the patient has no any activation of the herpes uh, before uh, the treatment uh, Uh, we can do uh, the surgery of course under the treatment under the supporting treatment uh, with uh, the antivirus uh, medications uh, in case of uh, um, other scars and traumas and so on we perform the surgery uh, at least one year after the uh, previous um, uh, surgery or trauma and so on so uh, one year uh, we th we suppose that that enough but without the supporting of the blood analysis of course And how long do you use prophylactic antiviral if you are doing uh, uh, laser treatment for these herpetic scars? Uh, it depends, of course, of the status of the patient. And if uh, he had only one episode of the herpetic keratitis many years ago, and he has no any uh, signs of the activation of the process in the blood or tears and so on, so uh, it not. very long and we uh, performed just uh, 10 days before the surgery and one month after the surgery uh, we also repeat the treatment uh, uh, because after the PRK uh, we use the steroids and it's a risk of the reactivation you know so uh, we uh, uh, have the repeated curse uh, one month after the surgery. If the patients had uh, some cases uh, some episodes of uh, herpetic keratitis before and he has uh, uh, some activation uh, so we perform one month uh, before the surgery the treatment and then uh, one month after the surgery we repeated uh, uh, again the course of the uh, valid clavier uh, peros for uh, the prevention of the of uh, clavier for um, uh, in, uh, decrease the risk of uh, the activation uh, we perform more than 200 uh, eyes with uh, um, herpetic keratitis and um, we We um, have the maximal follow-up period of 10 years, and um, among these uh, cases, we had only one case of the reactivation of the uh, herpetic keratitis uh, about three years after the surgery. But um, you know, I think it's a quite low um, rate of the reactivation. So we suppose that our system is uh, um, quite safe for such patients in, of course, uh, such um, quite high risk group. Thank you. I think that was an excellent presentation, Dr. Natalia. Very nice. Thank you very much. Again, Thank Dr. You. Alexei, your presentation was great, especially the basic sciences part that you, you know, studied with the with the with the laser keratoplasty. And okay. uh, Rajesh, do you have any questions? Yeah. Enter. No, do you, have any? Yeah. do you have any cutoff vision for uh, your? Uh, when do you say you don't operate a parietal membrane? Excuse me. No, uh, like a, a, for an epineural membrane, what do you have a cutoff vision? Which patients you will do surgery, and which you say, even if he comes with the epineural membrane and symptoms, you will not. Uh, cutoff vision was ninety uh, percent. Of course, we uh, look up about our patients. I mean, uh, if uh, the patient with high visual acuity. Uh, we are waiting it, uh, and uh, when uh, the patient. Uh, Uh, lost uh, one letter as minimum, and uh, his complaints of metamorphopsia uh, still increase. So yeah, it's uh, um, we take them, uh, we take him uh, to the surgery, of course. And we also combine with cataract and intraoral yeah. at the same time. Usually, it's uh, combined surgery. Okay, great. So, and I think wonderful session.
great talks so i learned a lot for, from so we were, yeah we were facebook live we were youtube live and we've been watched by over 4000 people on various platforms and i'm sure at your platforms also yeah. dr natalia yeah in your russian of filmological society platforms also would be watched so we should uh, thank parthamana uh, from moscow yes who supported the program sir would you like to say a few words in the air Uh, you are muted my pa you are muted sorry uh, again muted no again you are muted okay yes. uh, it was a pleasure being with all our colleagues from russia and from india and i think it was a wonderful session we really gained a lot of insights into the new technology and as to how uh, russian scientists and uh, especially professor fedorov uh, and all who are working at fedorov i institute are Uh, taking ophthalmology forward to new heights i think uh, as was said earlier we look forward to continued collaboration uh, between indian ophthalmologist and russian ophthalmologist and really really a pleasure being uh, with all of you and uh, look forward to um, meeting physically also as dr natarajan said and hope the covid goes over uh, we read a news today that uh, in russia one of the vaccines has been approved now for uh, usage so we are all looking forward to uh getting over this covid and going on to the earlier uh, forms of ophthalmic meetings etc thank you once again and uh, indeed uh, thanks to uh, dr boris for having come forward dr natarajan dr namrata and everybody for, for uh, this webinar thank you dr pavel thank you and thank vartamana uh, the company in moscow for the support thank rajesh and namrata and thank you nepal we would also like to thank Thank our support team at audio visual mr sunil mr kripal rana who organized uh, everything along with miss rakhi yes so thank you we look forward to having many more such uh, collaborative uh, webinars on a common platform with russia and thanks dr natarajan for the initiative yeah thank you dr natarajan for organizing this whole thing along with dr boris and thinking about it no sure and great thank you kripal and thank you sunil and the team thank for you. doing all the artwork uh, communicating everything to the russia thanks a lot dr pavel thank would you, you say thank you thank you thank you thank you so much spasibo dr pavel spasibo da spasibo wants to say something thank you so much again uh, uh, i think uh, it seems to me like uh, um, this conference uh, was very wonderful and um, uh, Uh, our joint symposium gave us uh, gave us an opportunity to once again share our experience uh, exchange our opinions and views get to know each other much better and stretch and friendly and professional relations between our russian uh, russian and indian colleagues thank you so much thank, thank you. you thanks bye bye thank you